new day. We thank you for the chance to meet again, to continue to study and talk and go through this book. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and um, may this book be edifying to us. So hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So we're... I think I'll put in there. So we're in the book of Ezekiel, and we've taken a couple of weeks, looked at chapter 8 really from a couple of different perspectives. Um, and now we take a look at chapter 9. So, again, briefly, do you remember what happens in chapter 8? According to my night, God, no, God goes through the temple with Ezekiel. Right. And they find what happening at the temple in this vision? They're not keeping the faith. They're not keeping the faith. <clears throat> There are these detestable things going on. And, and, and over the last couple of weeks, we went through quite, um, we went through in a fair amount of detail why this is important. And again, I think it's modern readers in a secular, pluralistic culture really stumble on passages like this and ask questions, oh, what's the big deal? Um, and so in the last couple of weeks, I tried to um, kind of talk about why it is a big deal and what the ramifications of these things are. And last week talked about what's, what's, what's happening in the temple will play out in the streets. And we talked about the relationship between idolatry and greed and violence. Um, at, the, um, at the 11 o'clock service, we were going through the Book of Kings. And, and what's interesting about the Book of Kings, if you've ever read the Book of Kings, you'll notice that again and again, God comes to the king and says, you know, to Jeroboam, so I'm talking about Jeroboam this week, I'm going to make you king. And, you know, you'll have all the, the things you want out of being king. Well, why is it good to be king? If, you get, if you're king, what do you get? The best food. The best food. <laughs> the best. The best. A beautiful place to live. Beautiful place to live. Honor. Honor. Power. Well, to be, a, to be a king in the ancient Near East, you, you can do anything. If you don't like someone, kill them. If, if, there's, um, if there's certain people you like being around, come and live with me, and you'll live in my court. If there's a woman that looks good to you, oh, you'll join my harem. I mean, it's, it's, it's like anything you want, you can have. Who wouldn't want to be king? And so God comes to these guys, like Jeroboam, and says, I'm going to make you king, king over ten of the tribes. And um, all I want you to do is obey my law. Well, why is it these kings have such a hard time obeying the law? Because they don't think it's for them. Well, they don't think it's for them. Why not? That's right. They're above the law. And, and, and this is a perpetual problem 
with who's ever at the top of the pyramid, the top of the ladder. It's the same now. It's the same now. This doesn't go away. And um, if you're if you're in charge, you get to say, and you get to have your will known. And if you make your will basically at the top, um, well, it's going to be disaster. And it is time and time again. So, so God goes through this again and again with the kings. Well, well, here at the temple, um, the, the, the main problem is that. And then that's what I'm going to lead off the sermon with at 11 o'clock. It's this great quote from Jacques Ellul. He notes, he's got this commentary. It's kind of a commentary. Lily and I were just talking about commentaries. This book about, um, you know, second kings and Elisha and Elijah. And Ellul makes the observation that God, you know, we are, um, the one thing we seem to be free of is God. And we're slaves to everything else. And that's just such an insightful observation <coughs> about the human heart, that we're, we're slaves to our appetites, we're slaves to our egos, we're slaves to um, the things that fascinate us in the world, we're slaves to uh, whatever's popular in a society, we're slaves to all kinds of things. The only thing we're truly free of, it seems, is God. And we want to be free of him because, uh, because we don't want anyone telling us no. I mean, this is just so common of human nature. And, and so what we see then played out in the temple, the temple where it's supposed to be the epicenter of God's reign. And what we see in the, the vision in chapter 8 is that it's the opposite of God's reign, that they've taken the temple and they've turned it into everything else. And this is, again, the, the idea behind, if you look at the Old Testament law, there's holy and there's common. What's the difference between holy and common? Divine and mundane. Okay, divine <laughs> and mundane. Anyone figure out where the word mundane comes from? Mundane. The great Dane. Mundo means world. Yeah. Mundane essentially means worldly. So, so why in Israel does God separate the holy from the common and instantiate that in law? What is he trying to do with the people? If if someone says nothing is sacred, why is that a bad thing? Because they have no respect for anything. Okay. So, so what <coughs> at the bottom, at the root, is respect? What what is the it honor? It's honor. What how is respect shown? Yes, how you treat people. But how you treat people specifically with respect to your will. So you, so in an ancient land, if you came up to a king, what were you supposed to do? Bow. Bow. And what does bowing communicate? Show respect and be the high honor person. That's right. And now, in, in very in very physical terms, if you the opposite of bowing is what standing straight and erect. And what are you saying? I'm low before you. That's right. If you stand straight and erect. You are saying, "I am large." Now, if you come and you go like this, what are you doing? I'm humble. I'm small. I'm at your mercy. Your will over mine. When you're large, in a sense, you say, my will over yours. And so, you know, two guys on the street, they're both full of ego. They get in each other's face. What do they do? That's right. Everything's about size, right? And it's about volume. And it's about, and then, and then they're shoving. And... What's all 
what happened about all People don't fight anymore. No, they just shoot. They shoot. Nobody ever still
Well, nobody wants to go there because anybody with any brain is going to say, well, that's... <clears throat> well, yeah. we have there. Dangerous. That's dangerous. It's radioactive. Well, now, that's very similar to the idea of the holy. And so, again, in the book of Samuel, when they're trying to move the ark, and when the ark's on a cart, and someone reaches out their hand to steady the ark, what happens? Yeah. They die. And then suddenly, David stops, and, oh, I thought, you know, I, I thought, well, you thought what? I thought I could make God into a little statue. And, and when there was a problem in my life, I thought I could bring my little statue and say, aha! I could put God in my hand and use God as my weapon and make God subject to my will. But the whole idea of the holy is what? Untouchable. Untouchable. You can't manage this. You can't play with this. And so, in, in, in chapter 8, they've basically taken control of the temple and said, hmm, we can, we can use this. We can make this, we can turn this to our will. Okay, well, chapter 9. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice. Bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faced north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Okay, let's pause. Because, so here's the scene. The temple is being defiled, and God's about to execute judgment. So what happens? You have six men coming in with a deadly weapon. And what? And one coming in with a what? Writing kit. Okay, now let's pause for a moment here. Y'all remember the book of Revelation? We only spent two years doing it. <laughs> well, anything you notice about the numbers here? Yeah, the seven. Two add up the seven, don't they? Now, what is interesting about this? Look at this number. What, what, what do you know about that number? Six, six, six. 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 The, the, the Hebrews had feelings about numbers. Six is not a good number. How many, I mean, any one angel, you saw what one angel or two angels could do to Sodom. I mean, God doesn't need more than one. And so surely the number six here is not accidental. So six, six will come and bring death. Well, let's see what the one does. Because six plus one is the complete number. That's very interesting. So six come with deadly weapons. One comes with a writing kit. Now the glory of the Lord went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side. Okay, pause. He's clothed in linen. What's going on with that? Lily's book in her study Bible. I bet you there's a note about it. There is, isn't there? Yeah. What's it say? Okay, let me just start right from um, <laughs> two. Uh, six men coming from the direction of the upper gate. There are six guardian angels of the city. Plus the seventh 
cold and many, uh, and so forth. And then the seventh angel of the judgment in Revelation 8, 2, 6, uh, came from the place where the idol that provoked to jealousy stood. And says, and what does it say about the linen? Um, he's clothed in, uh, clothed in linen. And, um, oh, it does. Oh, bad study Bible. <laughs> um, why is it important that he's clothed in linen? Who wore linen in the context of the temple? Well, the priests. The priests. Mm -hmm. Linen was priestly guard. Okay? Does it say J Jesus was wrapped in that when he was put in the tomb? Does it say linen? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to look that up. Um, but in this context, you've got six who have swords in their hand and one who has a writing kit and the one with a writing kit is clothed in linen. That gives him a priestly connotation. Now wait to see what he's about to do. Then the Lord called the man clothed in linen who had a writing kit on his side and said to him, Go through the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done to it. Okay, what's going on there? Well, but that, um, I think that's what the Gotten them or whatever, and as a result, now with reading this number chapter nine, uh, God was ready to destroy everybody, and He had not forgotten them, but I think they probably had forgotten Him. That's right. And so, therefore, He's showing them that you know He can do this, whether they like it or not. That's right. You know, and so. That's, well, that's exactly right, Lily. It's in chapter 8. Why had they been filling up the temple with all of their ways to try to get power? Because the Lord has forgotten us. So that's their justification. Now in chapter 9, six come with a deadly weapon. One comes with a writing kit, and he's told to do what now? Mark the Lord to who I like to bring it. Small amount of people who still believe. That's right. Now, how does how how are these people identified in that verse? What's that? He's going to put a mark on them. He's going to put a mark on them. But how is he to know which ones get the mark? What behavior is that connected to? Grieving and lamenting Grieving. over what has been done. That's right. And what does that show? Um, what what is that? That's right. That these people are not on board with what is happening in the temple. That these, as, as Corinne said, are a remnant. That these people are those who are still faithful to God. Now, this is important. Why? What's God about to do? Destroy. As I listened, he said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men and women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. Why begin at the sanctuary? Because that is the beginning. <laughs> that is the beginning. Because what's true in the sanctuary is true, throughout the land. is true throughout the land. That's right. So go and kill. And what's the division? Those who are sorrowful, those who lament what has happened in God's temple. Interesting. So they began with the elders who were in front of the temple. You know, the ones who should be the most holy. That's right. So the ones who the ones who the temple was, you know, now again, who is Ezekiel? 
He's a priest. And so it's beginning with those who are the custodians of the faith, who should know better, and they don't. And so Ezekiel is watching this. But now pay attention to how Ezekiel feels about this. You know, so that Paul, you know what surprised me is his little children. That's right. They what? They what? He said children. Well, you should. So in the text at eleven o'clock with 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 Jeroboam, Jeroboam's son is going to die, and there's this whole drama in in. In that chapter in First Kings, Jeroboam's son is going to die, and Jeroboam sends his wife in disguise to the to the to the pre, to the to the prophet with gifts in order to obviously try to secure a favorable message about the boy. Well, there's something ironic about that because if you believe enough that the priest has spiritual power, should Disguising your wife? Fool him? And in fact, the point in the story is the priest himself is already blind. And the Lord tells him, Jeroboam's wife is coming to see you. <laughs> and so when she comes to the door, he says, come on in, Jeroboam's wife. What's with the disguise? And he's a blind man. In other words, you go to God looking for power, but you imagine God can be bribed. You imagine God cannot see. Well, does any of this make any sense? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> and, and so, you know, here Ezekiel is a priest, and he's seeing, just like Marty said, next, next phrase here. So they began with the old men who were in front of the temple, the people who were supposed to be the guardians of the sacred, and the guardians of the past and the guardians of the tradition, the ones who would say, no, you may not defile the temple. We must observe the law. Begins with them because they're the most responsible. But yes, it goes all the way to the children. So finish my Jeroboam story. The prophet says, yes, your son will die. None of the rest of you who die will even be buried. And I'll talk about what, why that's important. And then he says of the son, your son was the only good one among you. Huh. What does that mean? It means, well, isn't this the truth of our society? That it's usually the good ones who suffer? When everything is chaos and evil, who are the ones who suffer the most? If everyone is cheating on their taxes, who's the one being ripped off? The honest person. And that's what's happening here. It's the fault of the people. The fault of the leaders that the people suffer. It's the way it always is. And so they go throughout the city. Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go. What does that mean? Why would God tell his own servants to defile the temple? How, how, what sense does that make in this context? Well, if he's going to kill all the people except for those that kept the faith, so to speak, why would you respect the temple when he's saying this is really what I'm killing you? That's right. Well, and, and, and I, you know, there's, there's an interesting duality that goes here because in the this is a really strange thing that you, it's really hard to get our minds around. So on one hand, they say, we must, so Solomon's reign, the transition from David to Solomon, uh, one of Solomon's son, Adonijah, decides he's going to grab the throne, okay? And um, he decides he's going to grab the throne, and he basically instruments a, a coup of sorts without David's knowledge, and then Nathan hears about it, grabs Bathsheba, and they go talk to David, and David says, Solomon's going to be king. Well, now suddenly Adonijah's scared. Where does he go, and what does he do? The Goes to the temple, grabs the horns of the altar. Well, what's this about? Well, because if you slay him in the temple, you defile the temple with his blood. 
Well, you can kind of get that. I mean, for years, sanctuary and church, well, this goes back, the sack of Rome in 410 AD. The barbarians are coming in and sacking Rome. Here's something that we very seldom pay attention to. The barbarians are Christians. <laughs> and so, and this is a whole political thing, they ravage the city, okay, but anyone who runs into a Christian church is not touched. Why? Because it's God's house and they respect the house. And so they will not shed blood in a Christian church. They will shed blood in a pagan temple. They won't shed blood in a Christian church. They're making a statement about that. But here we're talking about the Jewish temple and you're saying, you'd better not shed blood in the Jewish temple or you defile it. And you say, well, that sounds right. Because that act of murder would be very much not in keeping with a god of law. So you ought not to murder in the temple. But now let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves, what do we usually do with the altar? Kill animals on it. <laughs> the altar is filled with blood. So, oh, what's going on here? Why does God command fill the temple with blood? Defile it. This is a this is a subtle play being made. When you bring an animal up to the altar, and when the father of the family puts his hands on the animal, what is that father ceremonially saying? The animal pays for the sins of the family. The animal pays for the sins of the family. The animal, the blood of the animal substitutes our blood. Our blood. So God tells the six with, with weapons to slaughter in the temple. Why? What sense does that make? What's being communicated? There's no substitute here. They're paying for their own sin. This, they've wanted to be agents. They've wanted to be in charge. Yes. You know what being in charge looks like? You pay. What did Harry Truman have on the desk in We should think about that. When a president says, rightly so, the buck stops here. What happens when your president says, it isn't my, it isn't my fault? <laughs> this is a problem for us. Because what does leadership do? The buck stops here. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's and now obviously Harry Truman wasn't responsible for everything in the nation, clearly. But by saying that, he understood something about leadership. And he probably understood this, quite frankly, by being in World War I. Because if you read something about Harry Truman's life and what he did in World War I and how he grew up and what kind of man he was, you can understand why he finally said it. I mean, Harry Truman made one of the most consequential decisions of the 20th century. Remember what it was? Drop the bomb. The buck stops here. Good or bad, I need to face the music. Well, in a sense, what's happening in the temple is exactly that. The Lord is saying, I've given you everything so that animals could pay for you. You've rejected it. Guess what? You get to pay for you now. That. Oh. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. While they were killing, I was left alone. I fell face down, crying out. Alas, sovereign Lord. Pause. Notice the title Ezekiel uses in that moment. Why does he say sovereign? Well, what is what is a sovereign? King, ruler. The ruler. If in our current political climate we say um, countries are supposed to recognize the sovereignty of the other countries, what are we saying? Independence. Independence exactly. They have the right to do to execute. Well, 
Ah, sovereign Lord. On one moment, he's saying, you have the right to do this. But he's also making a plea. Now again, I noted, what was the one wearing the writing kit wearing? Linen. Linen. What does that connect with? Priesthood. Priesthood. What's the job of a priest? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. The job of the priest is to, to ask God on behalf of the people. Okay, what's Ezekiel? Priest. He's acting as a priest here in the temple even though his body is way outside of Babylon. Ah, sovereign Lord! Are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? And, and when he says this, he sounds just like Moses. He sounds just like Abraham. Why would I say Abraham? Very important story in Abraham. Before the angels go to Sodom, who do they stop and talk to first? Abraham. He pleads for a lot. That's right. He pleads, he actually pleads for the city on the basis of Lot. If there are 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? I will. If there are 40 righteous people, will you spare the city? And the point, of course, with all this is God didn't spare the city. What did that mean? He didn't find them. <laughs> there were none. Maybe Lot. Lot extends hospitality. But beyond Lot, no. It's the point of the story. He answered me, the sin of the people of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city full of injustice. Okay, what's, what, is, what, what point is God now making to Ezekiel? Same point at the end of chapter 8. What's true of the temple will be worked out in the streets. He's saying, you know, it, it, it's an ironic thing to accuse God of injustice when it's us doing the accusing. And so, and God says, the city's already full of bloodshed. Now, now, let's pause here in chapter 9 because what, are, what is happening here in chapter 9? What is this? Is this literally happening in Jerusalem at the moment? No. No, not, not like this. But what is about to happen in Jerusalem? Who is going to be going through the city with deadly instruments in their hands? The Babylonian army. And will they be going through the city and respecting those who have been marked by the one wearing linen? No. no. So it's an ironic thing to complain to God. Is this just? God, in a sense, says, Are you going to talk to me about justice? Look at the world. Look at the world. This week I saw in, I posted it on my Facebook um, feed, horrible story coming out of, I think it was Missouri. Little boy, seven years old. This boy was literally tortured to death by his own parents. Repeated calls to Child Protective Services. Nobody intervened. And, and the boy, they, they, they literally killed the boy. And when you read the kinds of things they put this boy through, I mean, it's just, you almost cannot imagine it. And then in the end, when they discovered, oh my goodness, we killed the boy. We don't want to be good. We don't want to be accused of murder. They got a pig to feed the boy's body to the pig to try to cover up the evidence. And we're going to point a finger at God and say, you're not just. This is how we are. And here's the thing. We, we very quickly say, well, they're just bad people. If we don't recognize the evil in ourselves, because I dare bet you get those parents alone in a room and you talk to them, 
Oh, the kid made all this noise. Well, he was a bad kid. I mean, they would have reason after reason they would spit out why, you know, their behavior to the child was justified. Well, we didn't mean to kill him. We had him standing naked in the cold in a swimming pool, tied up and shivering. You had him bound to a table. You starved him in a closet. Well, he deserved it. Yeah, right. And we're going to lecture God about justice. I mean, this is the irony of this story that Ezekiel quite rightly is saying, Lord, don't do this. He's acting as a priest. And God in a sense says, you're going to lecture me about justice? When I look at this world? So I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in Matthew and in Mark, I looked up uh, when they put Jesus in the tomb and it was in clean linen cloth. Yes. <laughs> and and then in the Mark it said that so Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in the tomb. Yeah. So you got these priestly connotations. The Bible is full of this stuff. Because again, how often do, are we told what Ezekiel is wearing now? No. Are we told what these guys are wearing? All we're told is they have deadly weapons. That's all we need to know. That's where, that's where the story points our eyes. This is what movies do. Movies always point our eyes. The story points our eyes to the weapons. The story points our eyes to the linen and the writing kit. So we answer, the sin of the people of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city full of injustice. They said, the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see us. So I will not look on them with pity and spare them. He's, and again, at least he's saying, you're saying I've forsaken you? Let me show you what forsaking looks like. I will not look down on them with pity or spare them. But I will bring down on their own heads what they have done. You want to be players in this world? I will give you more of the world. Let's see how you like it. Then the man in linen with the writing kit at his side brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded. And I looked and I saw the likeness of the throne of lapis lazuli above the vault that was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the men clothed, the man clothed in linen, go in, in along the wheels beneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. What's going on there? Well, what is, what is, what is the, well, let's talk about burning coals a little bit. You have to think about other stories in the Bible where there are burning coals. There's a really important one at the beginning of Isaiah. Isaiah is in the temple. And, that's right. Isaiah is in the temple. And then suddenly, you know, they talk about God showing up. Well, God shows up in the temple. And Isaiah hits the floor. And he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of an unclean people. What did we start talking about before? Holy comment. When Isaiah says, I'm the man of unclean lips in the midst of an unclean people, what is he saying? Israel is corrupt. And I've got unclean lips. What does that mean? Uncommon. Yeah. Not included. Now, why is that so critical? What is the if you, if you want to? I mean, people always ask, well, you know, what is being a Christian? Well, if you want to boil it all the way down to the bottom, well, Jesus does in one parable. Two men go up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, which means, well, when Jesus says he's a Pharisee, what is Jesus saying about him? He knows, he knows the law and tries to keep it. He knows the law and tries to keep it. What's on his lips? I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy because I keep the law. The other one is a tax collector. Well, again, who in that culture... Where do tax collectors stand? Wow. Why? They're traitors. They're traitors. They're traitors to the cause. They're traitors to God. 
They, they, they associate with Romans. And they're unclean. He goes up to the temple, and what does he pray? Forgive me, I'm a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, one left justified, and drops the mic. Well, why does he say that? And why does he pause it there? I've been figured out. Yeah, I've been figured out. Because the heart of our relationship to God is we go to God, and what do we say? Misery. Misery. Deliverance, gratitude. Misery. I'm an unclean, I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of an unclean people. And one of the seraphim goes and takes a coal from the altar and touches it to his lips. Well, what are the, okay, so what, what, what's with the coals? Okay, now let's, now remember, all this stuff is tied, to, tied together in the Bible. So if you remember again, back at the tabernacle and the altar and the sons of Aaron, <coughs> the tabernacle is being is being basically is, is being consecrated. And what's going to happen is that fire is going to come out of the holy of holies, and it's going to light the altar. And they're supposed to always keep the altar fed. Well, what does that mean? God's always making. That's right. God's always present. But where is God always present in a sense? Present in a sense. At the altar. At the altar. The fire of the altar. That's why you take the animals and you put them on there. But now the sons of the sons of Aaron are nervous. They have these sensors and they're nervous about everything going right. And so, what do they do? They bring other fire and they want to light the altar. And see, Reggie's there with the stuff. <laughs> Carol was worried. <laughs> um, and they want it, and they want to light it. And God kills two sons of Aaron, and you're like, oh, that's horrible, and it is. Well, is is this just an error of protocol? What's the story saying? It's not an error of protocol. And so, so now, the angel, fast forward to the temple, the angel takes a coal from the altar and touches it to Isaiah's lips. So what does that mean? It's a way of cleansing. Yes. It's a tiny, it's in a sense taking, it's in a sense taking the essence of the altar and purifying his lips and now saying what you say will now be holy because it has been cleansed by the fire of God. So now the man with the linen linen means what? Priesthood. He takes the coals and what does he do? Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. What's he doing? Purifying the city. What what has been done now in the city? Who's left living in the city? The, the remnants who have been marked. Oh, I, thought, I thought they had to kill them. No, they killed. They they didn't kill the ones who had the mark. The mark in this case was showing that they were not in favor of what was happening in the temple. So. In a sense, this is this is all connected here. Purifying the city, it's the city is now undergoing a sacrifice. And in a sense, again, this connects up with say Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities on the plains. What happens to them? What does God do? He purifies them. How? Fire rains from the sky, right? <laughs> Fire and brimstone. That's what we talk about. We talk about fire and brimstone. Fire rains from the sky and purifies the city. Well, 
here's the, here's the difficulty. Purifies the city of what? People. People. <laughs> evil people. Evil people. Think about the flood. What is the flood? Purifies the world. And who does he save? No one is family, the only righteous one. What about the children of the other families? They're gone. That's right. So, well, not, not just association, but by practice. Practice. So, that's right. So, you know, all of this stuff is tied together. And again, when we read the Bible, we should we should under you should say oh wow this is hard to know yeah it is but it's steeped and it's steeped from people who were taught this and learned this and read this so that all of these connections are known and so when we read it we're like well so what if he's wearing linen well 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 what's this about the burning coals well if you know kind of how this whole thing works then suddenly oh. Oh, I see how this connects up. I see how this holds together. Oh, but then what does it mean? What does it mean to me? And that's what I thought from it was that, you know, this the man and women it's mentioned three times. Is he not a warning of uh, the way God let him know this? Pay attention. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But there's a separation. Yeah. They say, well, Jesus was nice. Well, Jesus tells the parable of the sheep and the goats, right? It's a separation. Mm -hmm. Jesus tells the parable of the, of, I mean, Jesus tells more parables about final judgment in a tiny little space than you find anywhere else in the Bible. Well, why? Well, and, and then you might say, well, well, is Jesus a moralist? No. Jesus also told the parable of the two men who go up to the temple to pray. <laughs> and what does that show? Again, misery, deliverance, gratitude. I myself am a sinner. And what does Paul say about himself? I'm the, I'm the chief of sinners. Why does Paul think he's the chief of sinners? What did Paul do? He remembers his past. He remembers his past. He hunted down Christians. And turn them over for, you know, to be condemned. And when Stephen is being, Stephen in the book of Acts is in some ways shown to be kind of the most Christ-like person in the book of Acts. Both by his life and by his death. And when Stephen is being stoned, Paul is holding the garments. Now, there, there's even, I mean, think about that. He's holding the garments, which means he's not doing what? He's not objecting. Well, he's not even getting his hands dirty. He's the leader in charge. It's like, who's more guilty of Jesus' death? Pilate or the soldiers who killed him? The soldiers, well, they had choice in it too, but they could say, well, I was following orders. Paul is holding the cloak at Stephen's death, and he says, I am the chief of sinners. I held the cloak at, she, at Stephen's death. That's not far from, I washed my hands for Jesus' execution. I didn't get my hands dirty. Mm -hmm. and, then, and here's the amazing thing. Now think about this. How does Paul get converted? That's right. He blinds him on the road to Damascus. Let me ask you something. Who determined God's timing of when to blind him? Which means what? He allowed what he did. He allowed what he did. And you start thinking about that. And you say, wow. Isn't that the definition of sovereignty? And then you start thinking about all the things we're anxious about in our lives. And you say, this is way more complicated than just the simple ways we try to approach it. 
Lord, we are children playing with matches. We don't know what we're doing, which is exactly what Jesus said on the cross. But we are also the ones who defile your temple. And Lord, now your temple isn't a building. It's a people. Forgive us for how we do it. May we recognize our sin. And may we see you as, as the one only righteous. And may we place ourselves at your mercy. For we quickly learn that you are in fact merciful. And you are in fact good. And for that reason, the ultimate priest gave the ultimate sacrifice. And it is accomplished. So may we, Lord, live out our lives in gratitude for all that has been done for us. So give us your peace. In the name of Jesus, amen.